Hey guys, it's Q&A Tuesday. First question is a discussion I've had many a times, and this is in regards to things like watch winders and storing your watches and things of that nature, right? So uh, it comes from a gentleman by the name of Horology MD, so he's a doctor of watches. Hey, Roman, big fan of your channels. You're one of the few watch YouTubers I think always gives their genuine, authentic opinions on these subjects. Thank you. About a year ago, I bought a watch case from Wolf, a Windsor 10-piece watch box with drawer. I managed to get it on sale. I have been quite happy with it. It's, a nice, it's nice for display, but I can't use it for travel. I've been wanting an upgrade. Uh, buy something I can use for travel or store in a safe. I came across Bosphorus Leather, like their Petra watch case for eight watches. I think they're a Turkish company, but I can't find much information about them or any reviews. Have you ever come across any of their products? Would you recommend them? Uh, here's what I'm gonna tell you about watch storage and watch winders. I'm not a big fan of watch winders to begin with, unless you have a perpetual calendar that would be a pain in the ass to set if you're gonna run out of juice and not watch and then you gotta switch through the years or something you won't wear for a prolonged amount of time. To me, uh, a watch winder is nothing more than a beautiful accessory. And that can range from anywhere from $100 for something that's made in China, all the way to hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, for example, it's a German company, something boobing zorbing something i can't pronounce it but i'm sure ian can look it up but uh, a client of mine just bought one of those things like a hundred grand it's a beautiful big wind up for 50 watches with a bar cigar wi-fi bluetooth and all those and all the jazz that you can possibly imagine it can get right kidding about the bluetooth and the wi-fi by the way so i am a guy that says look what are you trying to achieve right what are you trying to do Oftentimes when I travel, I have the luxury of collecting a bunch of watch pouches that either usually come with watches or their service pouches or travel pouches and things of that nature. Uh, I should have brought some up because I know I have a bunch of them. Hang on a second. Anyone? Bueller? <laughs> anyway. Bueller. Someone from shipping, dial 104. I guess they're all out to lunch. Yo, you know how we have a box with those uh, watch pouches and stuff? Watch pouches? Like tra travel cases, watch pouches. It's like a gray box. We have a bunch of them in there. Uh, okay, bring it up for me, please. Okay. So while, uh, while shipping is going to bring that up to me, let's continue the discussion. But we're talking about needs, right? So for me, it all depends. I often don't travel with more than one or two watches. My wife may have one or two watches. So what I usually do is I make do with what I have. And that is, I'll usually take the travel cases from various brands, and oftentimes I'll put an AP in a Vacheron box and IWC in a Panorama box. It doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, it's just a small pouch to travel with. If you're someone that travels with one to two watches, that should be sufficient. And it doesn't really matter. Yes? What you want? You know those watch pouches that we have? We have a whole box of like little watch boxes, travel cases and stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like the... Uh, yeah, can I have that, please? Extra, like the whole box of it? Yes, please. Oh. As I was saying before I was really interrupted. So if you're gonna go out there and travel, you really gotta do it based on your needs, right? And if you want, I don't see anybody traveling with 10 watches, five watches. But in case you do, even if you're one of those guys that decides to do that, there's also the roll. So the watch roll, right? Now the downside of the watch roll is the fact that you can't get all watches in here, right? Watches such as older Rolexes or any, pretty much any current Rolex, right? You can simply take it off, it folds up neatly like this, and it goes into a soft leather pouch. This is by nobody. This is something I picked up at a trade show, and these things are a dime a dozen online. It doesn't matter what brand it is. As long as you have nice soft leather, it looks cool, which in my case is camel, love it, and it got orange on the inside. You pop this thing in. One, two, three, four, five, five here, right? You fold it over, you roll it up, and it goes right into your suitcase. Very, very convenient, right, for multiple watches. But you can, I can't put Audemars in there. Right? Your offshores and the way the lug systems are, it's never going to fold in such a, in such a matter. This is where I would probably end up going with travel cases. Oh, uh, I, got, I got Eli here from shipping. Hold that thought. Watch cases, right? We have a few that I've collected over the years. And I'm just gonna randomly pick some. So here's one from Jaeger La Culture, right? Pillow. Box, again, easily packs onto your carry-on, a backpack or a side bag or whatever you may wear. You can go bigger, you can go smaller. Here's one from IWC, same concept, right? 
This is a watch into which you can put a big bulky watch with a bracelet or a strap that you may not necessarily want to fold like I did with my Rolex, right? You also have travel cases such as these. This is from Harry Winston, right? So if you have a watch on a strap that you don't want to kink or you don't want to bend, easy, right? It's like a little envelope. Now, this stuff is also online. People sell this stuff for 100 bucks, 50 bucks, whatever it might be. So it's fairly accessible, right? There's a Richard Mill travel box, which I often use for many watches. Why? Because it's convenient, it's big, and I can sometimes put two watches in here. Let's say mine and my wife's watch. And maybe I should give some of these away. We have so much of this stuff. Oh, another type. I think this is a Breitling, right? This is, again, another floor brace. A lot of Breitlings come in stuff like this. So the options are endless. But to answer your question in regards to a Turkish company, a Chinese company, uh, odds are all this stuff is made in China anyway, including this branded stuff. Uh, there's really no rhyme or reason, no good brand out there to go with when it comes to watch stories and what you're going to travel with. Oftentimes, I travel with a watch on my wrist. And when I get on a plane, and especially if it's a long flight, uh, sometimes they give you those pouches, those, those kits that have socks. I'll take one of those socks, wrap my watch in, and put it in my backpack. That's really what I do. I've never heard of this company that you talked about, uh, and nor could I recommend it, but I can recommend to say not to uh, be a stickler on how you're going to store your watches. It's a lot simpler than you think, and you don't have to spend an arm and a leg in order to do so. Hope that answers your question. Next question comes from Stefano. Stefano. Next question comes from Stefano Della Costa. Long time viewer, long time fan, bought a couple of watches from us. Guy sent me a gift a while back. Thank you for that, Stefano. And he asks the following. He says, hey, I see all dealers on the Mandani Trusted Trade app that the majority always advertise their Rolex models with full or partial stickers. Why do the ADs in North America always remove the stickers even when I ask them not to do so? Can you do a video? They tell me that that's not allowed by their Rolex agreement and not even willing to give the bezel protector in which they claim must be returned to Rolex. Is there any truth to this? Absolutely there's truth to this. A lot of the sticker model Rolexes out there, you either have a dealer that doesn't give a shit, or you have a dealer that probably had something prior to Rolex literally telling their dealers, if you're gonna put stickered watches out there, we're going to take your line away. Why? Because what they're trying to do is they're trying to prevent the gray market, right? They don't want this stuff reselling. Paddock did the same thing a while back with sealed watches. Speaking of which, this, right? This is, this is a paddock uh, shipment container, right? When you get a paddock from the factory, this is what it comes in. It obviously doesn't come in its original box. And this gets sealed. It gets sealed in the plastic that goes inside here, and then it becomes double sealed when these stickers are actually connected along with this other thing that goes. This was from, oh wow, this was actually from a Sky Moon Turbine. It was from a 5002R that we sold a while back. Wow, can't believe we still have that, right? So this was the travel container that this thing came in, right? Collectors out there go ape shit for double sealed paddocks. Collectors out there go ape shit for watches that have the original stickers on them, right? Some go ape shit over that stuff simply because it really tells them this is a brand new watch because let's face it, you can polish up a watch today and make it look brand spanking new without anybody even knowing, including Rolex or Paddock for that matter, right? So this is what Paddock and Rolex both wanted to prevent. They didn't want their stuff to be treated like stamps, right? Where we were in a position where a double sealed Paddock 5711 was worth at least 10% more than a single seal paddock. And I wanted to get rid of that. And rightfully so, I agree with that 100%. And same goes for Rolex. And it is true in the United States of America, if a dealer's watch gets caught out there fully stickered, they will get into a heap of trouble upwards to losing their line. And that's the reason behind it. It is indeed true. In Europe, again, either older watches prior to that that made it out in the market before dealers started taking stickers off, but at the end of the day, any Rolex caught out there with stickers fully intact, I'm not sure about Europe versus US, but I'm pretty sure it's the same for everyone, can get the dealer into a heap of trouble. So hope that explains it a little bit, Stefano. Next question is from Angel. Uh, Roman, great content as always. I really do enjoy the content and your down to earth attitude. Thank you. I had a few questions. First, can you recommend places where you could recommend purchasing? a new case back for a modern Rolex GMT Master. I would like to engrave the back of mine and the off chance that I decide to sell it, I would like to have the case back clean for the watch. Second, any places you recommend sending the same watch to be served as in the AD around me, Northern California, once $1,500 for full service, I would not mind shipping out of state. Finally, I know that you don't have a crystal ball, but do you think there's a chance in the future gold sports Rolex has become more available? I've had no luck trying to get a white gold Pepsi or any precious metal Daytonas at all. Finally, 
at AD stop discounting. I haven't had any luck around me trying to get discounts at AD around me. Slow movers, gold subs, rose gold GMTs, Paddock World Times, or IWCs. These are all mom and pop shops, and I find it surprising that no one is willing to discount at all right now. Thanks again for all you do and for providing such informative entertainment for the watch community. So I actually responded to him in regards to the service, and I told him, I said, look, I have somebody here send you a watch, and I'll get a service for you a lot cheaper, because all he really wanted is a polish. And, and oftentimes when you go into these service centers or even mom and pop watchmaker shops, they always try to upsell you on the product, right? You go into a car dealership to change a tire, all of a sudden you need a new transmission, that type of thing, right? Now what about your air filter, sir? When's the last time you replaced that? I replaced it last week myself. It needs to be replaced. So with that said, let's talk about gold models, for example, for Rolex. So I told you guys this before. With the hype of a brand in general, hype as being your GMTs, your Batmans, your Submariners, right? Obviously, Daytonas and Sky Dwellers, right? They bring up the rest of the lineup. Consider the fact how much manufacturing was not done during the time of COVID. Consider the fact of how much shortage that created, considering the fact that the demand didn't slow down. Remember what I told you when I, when I predicted this and I said COVID isn't gonna hurt the watch market? Indeed, it made it better. So if the demand is still, forget that it's better. Let's say it's the same as it was pre-COVID but yet you didn't have an X amount of time in manufacture, what happens? You are gonna have a shortage of product. Prices are gonna climb. At the same token, you had some key models discontinued, created even a bigger hype. Beautiful new models I discussed earlier that came out. Again, all this thing plays into the fact that the other models, which seemingly you should be getting a discount and you should on the gold stuff, all of a sudden you're saying there's no discount. Not only is there no discount, there's also no availability, right? So now imagine yourself, you are a mom and pop shop, as you said it, you have an allocation. Throughout the year, you're getting 50 Rolexes, right? And you know that you got your two gold Daytonas or GMTs or uh, gold subs for the year. And you probably won't see another one for another six months. Are you motivated to discount it in a market that's so freaking hot that pretty much any Rolex that comes in can fly out the window? My average lifespan of a Rolex that comes into an office is about 17 minutes. Unless I specifically choose to, guys, let's not sell it real quick. Let's at least try to throw it up online, right? So this is the position that you're in, right? And that's the reason why you're not getting all these discounts. Now, things like IWCs, I'm a little surprised, and Paddock World Timers, I mean, you can call us, I'll get you a discount on that stuff. It's available. It's not as hot, right? But for the most part, this is what you as a client and all you guys, and us dealers included, are a victim of. The humongous hype, the shortage of goods, new models coming into the mix, certain models getting discontinued. If I'm an authorized dealer and I'm sitting on, on the older Samaritan and I'm still sitting on a Hulk and things of that nature, I'm gonna hold out for every single penny because I'm not gonna see those watches anymore, right? Makes sense. As far as the case back for your watch, honestly, the answer is I don't know. It's odd that uh, you just asked me that because I'm actually in the process of looking for a case back for Samaritan that I delivered to a very special client and a fan of my YouTube, you know who you are because I wanna do the same thing for him. I already sent him the watch and I'm now looking for a case back for that watch. Uh, I don't know if there's an aftermarket case back. I don't get into that stuff, so I don't really have experience, but I am currently looking for one for a Samaritan because I wanna engrave something in the back. and Like you said, not spoil the watch. And if I do find that out, I'll shoot you a quick email. Next question comes from a gentleman by the name of Edward from London. Hi, Roman, hope you and your family are well. I love the show and I've been an avid follower from the beginning. I think your content is amazing and your love and passion for watches is infectious. The production team must be huge, so hats off to everyone involved. They're doing a fantastic job. I don't know, it's pretty odd. I usually tape these on my own, but Ian decided to sit in, so he's, hold on a second. Let's get Ian real quick. Ian, say hello to the people. Howdy, bro. <laughs> You're supposed to say, hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. <laughs> there you go. So. Uh, in either case, uh, I thank you for all your comments. And by the way, guys, I read your compliments that usually come with every single email. I do enjoy them, I do take them in, and I'm really, really appreciative. That's why I always read them, and that's why I always say thank you at the end. Anyway, as you have said many times in the past, your favorite watch brand is Audemars Piguet. I watched your upload of What's On My Desk 86, The History of Audemars Piguet, and th thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you. My favorite watch brand was Rolex, but now it's Audemars Piguet. I've owned two Rolex sports watches. One was in 16610LV, aka the Kermit, and uh, one Batman. I've sold both of them and looking for a new watch to purchase. Good timing on selling them. The market is so high right now. Right now is a really, really good time to sell uh, your Rolex, by the way. I've only held one Royal Oak and I loved it. I feel like a step up from my Rolex sports models. I was looking at Audemars Piguet online and came across a Royal Oak chronograph, the Hourglass Edition. I'm gonna have Ian pop that up on a screen. It's stunning and I think it's beautiful, platinum too. I think it must be a very limited watch, but there's not much information out there. Have you bought or sold any? 
What do you think about the Hourglass Automark PK? There are only four on Chrono 24, some are priced upon request, and the other ranging from 120,000 British pounds to 155,000 British pounds. Out of my price range at the moment, but putting serious time and effort into my property development company in London, so one day it will happen. I'm curious of your thoughts on this watch, and is it possible to ever get one? I thought if anyone would know about this watch, you would. Your knowledge is outstanding, plus a massive watch dealer and way up to speed on watches like this. Thank you so much for taking the time to read my email. Keep making great content, and you'll be making many people very happy. Wishing you all the best, Edward. Thank you, Edward, again for the kind words. Uh, gonna back up to where you said Autumn RPG is a step up from Rolex, and that brings up an actual topic that I'll briefly talk about. Um, again, I am the guy that always says buy what you like first and foremost that any watch regardless of its price should be precious to you and you only based on your love for that particular watch and it's not rocket science that you know that Audemars BK is a step up from Rolex right but I just want you in the back of your head to keep in mind that yes this is a step up just like a paddock would be a step up just like an FP Jordan something that's generally more expensive right from the bottom of their line right because you know, Audemars Piguet doesn't have a watch in their lineup that starts at $6,000, right? So it definitely is a step up, but when you consider that in the back of your head, don't lose sight of the love for the watches themselves, and keep in mind it's not always about the price. But to go to the Hourglass Edition, the green dot, I've had two of those watches and I've sold both of them, one for 165,000 US and another one for 155,000 US when they first hit the market. Extremely limited edition. Both of the watches that I sold, the majority of the watches that I sold, they sold to the Middle East due to the color green, which is Mecca. Of course, for me, green holds a special place in my heart as well, right? I'm a Philadelphia Eagles fan, which is green, right? We bleed green in Philadelphia, as they say. And two, I'm ex-military, so I love the green color. You think that's camo, you think that's green. When the camo first came out from Audemars Piguet, the first one, not the latest couple, I had that watch and I wore it for a while because it was all camo, right? Okay, so the Platinum Royal Oak uh, Hourglass Edition. Uh, actually, information is fairly easy to find on this watch. You can go right to the Hourglass's uh, website and I'll tell you. It was a limited edition of 20 pieces made in platinum. Don't, I don't know what the retail was. I know that it was somewhere around $100,000. Right now, the market has softened up on them. Uh, if somebody offered that watch back to me, I, I don't see much. I'm probably going to want to pay in the low 100s because they're not that easy to sell. At the end of the day, you have to look at what you're getting. You're getting a Platinum Royal Oak at over $100,000. It's a lot of money. So unless you somebody doesn't just doesn't care and, and so in love with Audemars Piguet that you must have the most rare piece, right? Because this will be a collectible 30, 40, 50 years from now. This will be the watch to collect because they only made 20 and it's still an attractive watch from the most popular line, which is the Royal Oak, right? But at the end of the day, it's not a very practical watch because in platinum, on a bracelet, it's a very heavy watch, so it's not easy to wear. And at the same token, there's a lot of guys out there that say, well, shit, for $150,000, there's a lot of watches that I can buy. There's a lot of options out there for me that resulted in a dip. Like anything else with new Rolex or new AP, something comes out, it's high out of the gate and it sort of comes down. Now, coming down to earth today, I could probably find that watch around 120, 130, maybe $140,000. So when I say come down to earth, it's still over list because it's so rare. But not only because it's so rare, but because not one of them has sold for less than a list. So they're going to be always over list. Whoever has them is going to want more money and odds are whoever bought them. It's not somebody who's going to be in need of money and have to do a fire sale or anything like that. But uh, if you're going to go into Royal Oak, I would suggest this is not one that you start with. If you like the Royal Oak Chrono, I would look at the original 39 millimeters right now. They're slowly climbing up in price. I've had a blue one here as low as 16,000. Now they're pushing mid 20s especially for the blue dial, right? Original uh, 15,339 millimeter, 15,400s, maybe even the 15,500s, the newer ones that came out, and any chronograph or dual time power reserve variation, whichever other variations you wanna go with. Great watch, beautiful watch, would love to own one of these, but definitely not a good start for your Audemars Piguet collection. Hope this sheds a little bit of light into this for you. Next one is not a question, but a shout out to a gentleman by the name of Graham. Hey, Rome, a huge fan of your channel and Luxury Bazaar. I was watching football soccer to you guys. Actually, it's football to me too, remember. I'm a product of the old uh, Eastern Bloc, so we used to call it football just the same. Uh, Leicester City playing in the Premier League against West Brom and could not help but notice similarities between you and the West Brom manager and Croatian international Slavin Bilic. What do you think? And he included some pictures. Of course, he took one picture of me from one of my videos. I'm not really posing the same, so I'm going to... For Ian's sake, I'm going to try to pose the same as these pictures. So here's picture number one, side by side. And picture number two is just a frontal shot. You guys tell me, you comment below, you, tell, you let me know. I can certainly see similarities. 
the guy's got the same bags under his eyes as I do, and uh, certainly the beard style is, I, I'm not sure my beard is nicer. But uh, yeah, because I have the point, you know? I, I make it a point to match up the two points. You know what I'm saying? Point to point. Anyway, my friends make fun of me because of that, and Ian is still laughing in the background, by the way. Uh, but uh, Graham, thank you so much for these pictures. Love that. And uh, you guys decide whether or not we do look alike. I mean, we both have Slavic backgrounds, so I would imagine certainly there's a lot of similarity because of that. I'm going to do another one from a gentleman by the name of Richard. Uh, as a watch enthusiast, I have found your channel both entertaining and educational. Thank you. I have a small collection of watches including Omega, Mont Blanc, Raymond Whale, and others. All purchased because I like them, not with an eye to move them on for a profit. Good job. Thank you. I give myself a ceiling of about 5K on watches, new or used. With that said, I'm always looking for quality and value in overlooked and underappreciated brands. I wanted your thoughts on micro brands who buy stock movements from established companies like Ita and Salida and use them as the engine of their watches. About three years ago, I bought a Squale GMT Pepsi with a Salida movement. I set low expectations compared to my Omega Seamaster, but it has been a bulletproof watch. It looks great and it keeps great time. In your opinion, is there real value in second tier watches in respect to quality or did I just get lucky? Go Navy, beat Army. You lost me there, I'm an Army guy, so I'm gonna say go Army, beat Navy, but that's not what this channel is about, I don't really care. Uh, so, I told you guys in the past, I'm not big in terms of experience on micro brands, right? We do sell a lot of the brands that you mentioned, like Blanc Blanc, like Raymond Wells, Oris, and things of that nature, right? But I've never really gotten into the nitty gritty of them. It's a fairly new business model for us. We got into it about two years ago. So maybe I should get more into it and do some more reviews if you guys want on some of their lower price merchandise. I don't wanna say lower quality or second tier as you mentioned them, because again, at the end of the day, Ether movements are used in a crap ton of major watch manufacturers and so is leaders. Ether movements are used in a lot of uh, big brand names, right? And I talked about like the in-house movement versus the outhouse movement. Does that even make sense? Outhouse movement? I know Ian you know, is gonna pop in a picture of an outside toilet. I, I, I just know it, I just know it. But anyway, um, so in-house movements, I said, they're not necessarily better, they can be a marketing technique. And look, Ether manufactures so many movements, they know what the hell they're doing. And I do think that there's value in going and getting, as you dubbed it, a second tier watch uh, that has an ETA movement because that is a proven machine, right? And oftentimes for a simple watch, odds are the ETA movement is gonna be better than an in-house movement, at least in my opinion. Now, if you're gonna talk about decoration of the movement, you're gonna talk about polishing, things like that, but if you're strictly talking about uh, the fact you put it as a bulletproof watch, right? I'm a big fan of that and I don't see anything wrong with, and, and in fact, I would encourage you guys to, you know, that are buying, uh, less expensive watches. I don't, want to, I don't want to rank them as second tier watches, it's just not fair. But if you're gonna buy watches that are less expensive, right, and they do have an ETA movement in them, then odds are you're gonna get yourself a good watch because these guys make thousands upon thousands of movements and supply many, many, many different companies. I'm fairly certain Ian can pull up a list of companies that use ETA movements and you'd be surprised some of the brand names that are gonna be under those. Uh, so hope that sheds a little bit of light. Here's a, a comment from Stephen F. And I've told you guys in the past, uh, I love when you guys send me things and you critique me once in a while, you state your own opinion that may not necessarily be in line with mine. And I'm gonna finish with this question slash uh, statement. I am very, very open to criticism. In fact, I even encourage it if you feel I said something wrong, right? Because I make mistakes too sometimes, right? With movement numbers and things of that nature or whatever it might be. Uh, but at the same token, you don't necessarily have to have the same opinion on a certain topic as me. And case in point here with Steven who writes, hey Roman, I'm a huge fan of your channel, particularly Q&A Tuesday. There was a question about three weeks ago that you answered that I wanted to offer a different opinion on. The question is at 1545 in the link below. Ian, if you can pop in that question. Background constant as a whole often appears to be forgotten and ignored member of the Trinity. You hardly ever hear anyone mention VC and you don't see an objective reason why. Does it all really come down to marketing and advertising or is there another legitimate reason that is so rare to hear watch sellers, collectors, and enthusiasts mention the brand? As someone who works in finance and knows publicly traded companies fairly well, let me offer a different perspective. Brands that are owned by publicly traded companies or other entities driven by revenue are more focused on volume, not margin. Oftentimes their interests are about making share shareholders happy, not maintaining exclusivity. If you want to know what brands will be hot and rare, there's one almost sure way to tell as an opinion. Whether their parent company is a public traded company or owned by a group motivated by revenue, Breitling for example, probably the equity firm, Rolex, PP, AP, FP Jour are all private, likely more motivated by margin and exclusively not by volume and total revenue. I know there are some exceptions, the Snoopy Watch, Bronzo by Richmond, which is the Panerai obviously, and Odysseus, 
uh, by Richmond. But I'm curious what you thought on my analysis of the market. A full disclosure, I am a firm believer on buy what you like, like you talk about. But figured I'd offer this opinion to you and get your thoughts. You know what? There's so many different ways to slice a chicken, if that's even a saying, right? I just pulled that one out of my ass, didn't I? Okay, never mind. So there are many different ways to look at things, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And I like when people think outside the box, same as Steven just did. So if I'm looking at a company that's publicly traded, right, or as part of a group and I need to produce numbers, I'm fully aware of that. And I'll even tell you how I'm fully aware, since we're being transparent, right? Because I deal with a lot of these companies on a hush-hush and I buy closeouts from them. And the reason they put out closeouts is to bump up one thing only, and that is what you mentioned, which is revenue. As a privately owned company, I can also see how uh, a company can be driven by profits, which makes sense. I'm a privately owned company. Yes, it's great to say I have $120 million in revenue. Well, I'm going to hit $150 million in revenue and blah, 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 blah. But if my profit margin is 2%, who cares about the revenue, right? So that revenue also has to make sense. Now, in the case of Vacheron, you would think based on what you said, that would be a privately owned company, right? Because they're not really driven by revenue. They're not driven by margin. They're driven by revenue, but yet their sales are down. But they're not. They're part of the Reachmont group. Right. So you would think it would be the opposite. They would want to put out a lot of watches and drive, but they don't really put out a lot of watches. And that's the thing is. So it seems to me it's got to be on a case by case basis. So the Richmond group, I know you got Bucciolati. I know you got Cartier. I know you got IWC, Jaeger, Piaget, Roger Dubuis, Vacheron, as you mentioned, Lang, Bon Marcier. And then we get into things like Mont Blanc and Chloe and so on. There's, there's a gazillion companies that, this, this, that they own. I still feel that someone in Richmond is out there looking on the stuff on a case-by-case basis. Vacheron is the oldest running brand out there, right? They're part of the holy trinity. So I don't think the reason Vacheron prices are not as popular is due to the fact that they put out too much. They don't. Get out there and try to find Vacherons. I get calls on Vacherons all the time, and it's not a matter of picking up the phone. And I'm not talking about overseas. I'm talking about any Vacheron. The allocation is not that big. I know a lot of Vacheron dealers, they only get a handful of pieces a year. Uh, you know, given to them. So I understand where you're coming from, and I will agree with your approach, and I agree that's how you can look at the stuff, but I don't, I think it's got to be taken on a case-by-case basis. And in the case of Vacheron, I know for a fact there's not a lot of goods out there which causes too much product out there so that they're not as popular. I still would go back to the fact that they're a bit too conservative for their good. To me, it almost as if they come off cocky, hey, we're Vacheron Constantine, we don't have to do this. We're the holy, we're part of the holy trinity and we'll turn things back around. I would love to see Vacheron or the Richmond Group and Vacheron do go after some of the hottest names, uh, be it music industry, sports, uh, entertainment, whatever it might be, and pick up a few ambassadors and the likes of what Richard Mille did, just to see the difference. Of course, I'm not in the position to run that little experiment, and I'm sure that little experience would run millions of dollars. It may just be that, actually. It may just be the fact that, look, maybe they're recognizing what I'm saying, right? Maybe they're recognizing and what you're saying, but and on the one token, they're saying, well, look, we want to keep it as exclusive as possible, so we're not going to overproduce to show that revenue, right? Our rev- we're okay with the revenue that we have without hurting the brand. And the same token, they said, that we know we need this ambassador, but that's going to cost millions of dollars. Now it doesn't make sense financially, right? Because, again, this is still a huge group, and they're there to turn a profit as well, right? Yes, they want revenue, but I'm sure at the same token, they want a profit. So I do agree with you. Uh, in what you're saying. I just think in the case of Vacheron, you, again, you have to look at it on a case-by-case basis, uh, you know, based on the brand itself. And I appreciate a different opinion, guys. If at any time you hear me say something and you don't agree or you have a different opinion, you don't, you don't have to disagree with me, but you may also have a different opinion on things, I'll be happy to put that out for all you guys to listen to. Because look, I'd like to assume that my viewers are also very knowledgeable in this little thing called watches, because obviously you guys are all into watches. Uh, and certainly you guys all come from different walks of life and dif- have different types of experiences. Therefore, they could result in a whole lot of different opinions. I'm going to leave you guys with that. I want to thank you for tuning in once again. As always, don't forget, this show is only possible because you guys email me, romansharp at luxurybazaar.com. I'll do my best to try to get to your questions. Other than that, hit the like button, subscribe if you're not a subscriber to my channel. As always, I ask you share this video with like-minded individuals because this is what helps my channel grow organically. Other than that, I'm going to see you guys next Tuesday.